Hi, I'm Dwight Lemke. Today I want to talk to you about the idea of negotiation. Negotiation is basically a discussion which is meant to end in some kind of an agreement or concord. It comes from Latin negotiate, which is done in the course of business, which is entirely appropriate because this is a business class. Uh, most people, though, confuse negotiation with the idea of haggling, which is uh, a dispute or bargaining consistently, generally over price. Uh, coincidentally, that word comes from the Old Norse hogve, or to hew, which means to cut or to whittle away. Not surprising when you think about haggling. So what, we, what we're trying to do here is separate some of the myths from some of the, the, the truisms that we have of negotiation, some of the laws, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of strategy that's going to go into this class. We're going to be talking about how to negotiate, and it's going to be you're going to be spending a lot of time practicing negotiation as opposed to talking about it in theory. Which leads me to the first real world application. Let's call it my first law of negotiation, which is never sit down to a table unless you have done your research and have a strategy. In fact, I think this is so important, it might even be called the zeroth law, uh, with apologies to Isaac Asimov for borrowing his term. Uh, there are some books out there that you know that have been talking about negotiation for decades. Probably the you know the the one that most people bring to mind is this idea of getting to yes. There's been that one and like four others based upon that same book since then. Uh, and one of the first rules in that is the idea of don't bargain over positions. We tend to think of hard nosed negotiators coming in saying, "Here's what I want, take it or leave it." Well, that's what we mean by bargaining over positions. And we tend to think about that in terms, in, in, here in Australia, about union negotiations, where management presents its claim, unions present their ambit claim, and somehow they compromise in the middle. Well, the problem with negotiating over a position is that it tends to you know, wind up at loggerheads, where people are going to argue about nothing. Because uh, what we're trying to do here is to set up a negotiation that meets three general criteria. Among these are, it should produce a wise agreement. Wise, if, if that is possible at all. It should be efficient. That is, there shouldn't be layers and complications. I am a firm believer in the KISS principle, and this accords with that. And finally, it should improve or at least not damage the relationship between parties. The idea is that most negotiations don't take place in isolation. We're going to want to sit down at the table another time with these folks. So if you damage the relationship, what you're doing is you're doing yourself a disservice in the long run. And to think about this, you know, how about if you're in a negotiation, which is not uncommon, where there's multiple uh, positions at a the table, there are multiple entities. I mean, we tend to think about negotiations simply, you know, person A and person B. Well, how about if we've got 12 people sitting around the table representing 12 different interests? If all 12 of those entities engage in positional bargaining, we could be there an awful long time. In fact, the term hell freezes over is probably an appropriate uh, rubric there. So how do we get, a, get around this? Well, being nice is no answer. Uh, giving in, I mean, there are some people who are just born to hate conflict. And they tend to give in, this is called soft negotiating. Well, whatever you want. The problem is, is that resentment starts building up on our side then, right? Damn, we sit down at the table and got screwed again. And eventually you're going to wind up in a position where you really don't want to do this anymore. So this weakens you in the long run. So being nice is not an answer. And the other thing is, just from a pure tactical point of view, if we're sitting across the table from a hard-nosed negotiator and we're taking the soft position, guess what? We're going to lose. It's as simple as that. And that's not very conducive to a long-term negotiating relationship. So what we're heading for here is what some of the authors, in, in this case of getting to yes, called principled negotiation. And there's four components to that that I want to go into here. First of all, people. We need to separate the people from the problem. We're solving a problem, but we're negotiating with people. Those people at the other side of the table really aren't the problem. The problem is, is on the table to be solved. Keep that distinction in mind. 
when a focus on interest, not obligations. That is, what is it, what are we actually trying to accomplish here? Not what do we say that we're up to at the table. These can be entirely two different things. We want to be able to invent options. The idea here is borrowed from game theory, which we're going to talk about a little later in the term. But a negotiation that just tries to split up the pie, you know, it's called a zero-sum game for a reason, because the size of the pie is the size of the pie. But by inventing different options, we can use our creativity at the bargaining table to actually increase the size of the pie and therefore benefit all the parties who are sitting around the table. And finally, we want to look at the criteria by which we're going to judge our outcome here. We want to use objective criteria whenever possible. We want to avoid vague terms. In my, one of my personal bugbears is fair. When students come to me and say, well, Dwight, that's not fair. I will normally pause and say, okay, give me your definition of fair. And about that time, they realize they've walked into a logical trap and begin stuttering. But the idea is we want to have a concrete term here, a concrete criteria by which we're going to judge the success of this negotiation. So every negotiator faces two kinds of issues when they sit down at the table, in the substance and in the relationship. That The substance of negotiation is what are we here for, what are we trying to do? The other part is the relationship. Are we going to strengthen this relationship between the folks around the bargaining table, are we going to make it weaker? I mean, you can't treat, you know, the person at the other side of the table as this, this is a one-off kind of thing. We're not going to negotiate one time, get it over with, and get out of there. We're going to be back at this table again if we're going to have a long-term relationship. Uh, positional bargaining puts the relationship and the substance both in jeopardy. So what we're trying to do here is make the relationship better over time while achieving the aims of the negotiation. So we're going to need to look at things like how do we prepare for multi-issue negotiations. They're very seldom is there going to be just one that we can cope with. Should we negotiate the easiest issues first, the hardest issues first, or neither? Well, there's multiple opinions on that. How do you structure your offers? How do you handle sharp differences in beliefs and expectations about the value of the negotiation? I mean, sometimes we're dragging people to the table against their will. What do you do? What's the role of compromise? Pay attention to this. What is the role of compromise? Some people mistakenly assume that compromise is the goal of negotiations. It's not. So, what we're trying to do here with negotiating multiple, or when we have multiple issues to negotiate, is come up with that non-zero sum game or a positive sum game outcome here. We're going to increase the size of the pie. And the reason we do that is by folding multiple issues together, we can engage in what uh, the negotiating literature calls log rolling. I don't think they've ever actually done any log rolling, or they realize that's probably not the greatest metaphor, because you really don't go anywhere when you're, ro when you're log rolling. But the idea is to start rolling downhill and increase the size of the snowball, which here in the tropics is a poor metaphor as well. But the idea, log rolling requires that you know your own priorities, but that you learn the priorities of the folks across the table so that you can add more issues in and, and therefore create value. So, as I said before, negotiation entails compromise, but it isn't, comprom it isn't compromise. The problem with sitting down at a table and developing these options is it tends to be foreign to a lot of folks. But it's what we should be actually heading for. So... Part of the reason that we have a problem doing that is first, is basically fourfold. One of those is premature judgment. I know what the issues are. Don't bother me with the facts. Uh, number two, we search for the single answer. There must be one single solution out here that solves all of our problems. Probably not. The assumption of the fixed pie. Well, there's nothing else we can put on. Well, let's put some other things on the table then. Let's be able to increase the size of that pie. And finally, thinking about solving their problem is their problem. Well, not really, because we're at the table here trying to create options that solves all of our problems, not just theirs. So, if we're going to start creating options, there's some basic rules we have to follow, or some basic concepts we should probably keep in mind. We need to separate the act of creating options from the act of judging them. 
this goes back to basic brainstorming. That when you when you're generating ideas is not the time to be critical about them. We've all sat at a table where you know where you come up with a wild idea and someone goes, "Oh, that's stupid." Okay, I'm reason. Well, I'm no 100 percent. You know that uh, the the, po the folks that employed Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak are probably feeling pretty sorry for themselves when they realize that the stupid idea that they uh, dis that you know that they ridiculed turned out to be the personal computer. Enough said. So we're going to broaden the options at the table rather than looking for that single answer. We're going to search for mutual gains where everybody benefits and invent ways of making the decision easy. I mean, we don't want to face people with a difficult decision because then they're going to go through all kinds of remorse and double thinking. We want them to do is be able to look at that and go, yeah, that works. Let's do it. I don't know why we didn't think of this before. That kind of eureka moment is where we should be. So when we're thinking about doing this, our, as I said, our goal is to maximize value. Both sides can be better off when an additional issue is added to negotiation. Well, you know, you're really interested in this. I'm really interested in this. Let's put them both on the table. I mean, if I, if I really want something that doesn't matter much to you, why don't you throw it on the table? It's almost cost-free, generates more value at the table, and we come out with that win-win relationship, which is what the authors talk about. In technical terms, what we're looking at here is looking at a Pareto improvement. Uh, Villafredo Pareto it was an economist a couple of centuries ago. And the idea was that we can create value across a curve. And any point in that curve is, is, is roughly equivalent. What we want to do to improve Pareto efficiency is to move the curve. But it's seldom our only goal. So we're looking for this idea of mutual gain. Uh, assuming that there's a fixed pie out there is probably our biggest one. Quite often when we sit down in negotiation, that's it. Here's what we're going to talk about, nothing else. And if you come to the table with that kind of an idea, that is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. There are some ideas here, though. What happens if you're sitting down at the table and the other side is just more powerful? Well, we need to talk about that, too. We're going to talk about it more in the long run. But our basic idea here is a BATNA, B-A-T-N-A, BATNA. Keep this one in mind. It's going to come back. That's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Every time you sit down to a table, you'd better be prepared to walk away at some point in the negotiations. And your BATNA gives you that. If the negotiation is breaking down, what's my best alternative? If you go, well, I can accept that, then you've got a, a place where you can walk away. If you can't walk away, you're going to set yourself up for losing at the negotiation. Pretty simple kind of concept. So, if they have a stronger BATNA than yours, you know, or they've got a stronger position, look at your BATNA, perhaps get it from the table and walk away. The idea here is to attack their position, or don't attack their position, I should say, but to look behind it. Uh, one of your authors refers to this as negotiation jujitsu, which is a, a term I, I quite like, which is basically using their strengths against them. So rather than getting an argument with them, look behind their position. What is it they really want? Do they even know what they really want, or do they just come to the table with their position laid out? How about if they're throwing stuff at you? Here's my ideas. What's wrong with them? I mean, they think that they're smarter than you. Make them prove it. <laughs> So we can recast an attack on us. That's an attack on the problem. Yeah, yeah, I might be the dumbest person at, at the negotiating table, but tell me, how are we going to get out of this situation? I mean, you've got some ideas here, obviously, to solve this problem. Please enlighten me. Ask questions and pause. This can have quite an effect. Uh, people hate silence. Uh, I, I practiced this when I was uh, younger, I, when I was giving professional presentations. Uh, I was one of those kids who was always raising his hand and going, you know, call on me, call on me, which meant I wanted to blurt out the answer to questions when I was asked them. 
it doesn't sound professional, doesn't sound thoughtful. So I train myself that when I'm giving a professional paper presentation and somebody says, well, you know, what, what do you think about this? I go, hmm, you know, that's a really good question. And I've got just the answer for that. I look like I was thoughtful. I considered their question. I've shown them respect. And I've had that little bit of silence in there, which, which is what gets them to start thinking as well. So if I ask my question and pause, the silence is going to start to get to folks. And they're going to want to provide you with an answer. And there's finally one further idea. We can use what's called a one text uh, solution or one text procedure. Basically, this one is going to involve a third party, though. We get a third party to come in, sit down at the table, listen to both sides, go away, summarize everything for us, and put it all in one text, one document. So now, we're no longer arguing about definitions, and I thought you said, we're arguing the text in this document. All of our positions are laid out there in one nice document. Hopefully, our facilitator has gotten to the core issues, and about that time, we can sit down and go, all right, now that we've agreed on at least what we're arguing about, because you can see negotiations around the world where they can't even agree on, on what it is you know, they're trying to accomplish. They can't even agree on what they're arguing about. It's hard to get anywhere. Well, I think that's all I have for you today. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back together again soon. Bye-bye.